Good morning, everyone. Welcome to our worship service on the second Sunday of June. No matter who you are, where you are on life's journey, you are welcome here, whether joining us by YouTube or in person. We greet you today and look forward to uh, worshiping together. Next week is Father's Day, and the week after that is Pride Sunday, where we'll celebrate our LGBTQ community and members, and uh, that will be the rest of this month. Uh, I would ask you to please sign the registers at this time, and we want to welcome Anne back on the harp. She's been here before, and so she's coming back to share the harp with us. And Carol Sue is back here, who just is here a lot in these days. You know, we, we're giving our organist uh, weeks off during the summer, and so uh, thankfully Carol Sue is able to fill in and be here, and so we're grateful for her uh, and Ann providing music today. Linda is our worship leader today, thanks to her as well. We continue our Zoom gatherings on uh, Saturday at 10 for Bible study and Sunday at 2 o'clock for the fellowship time for those who are either away from us. You know, part of the pandemic is we became a hybrid church, meaning we got people that meet here and then we got people in other states that join us uh, for these meetings. And so uh, those will continue. And we are going to uh, put our toe in the water, our, our finger in the water, uh, and try a July 4th potluck after church. You know, we thought, well, we're meeting now, and by the way, masks are optional. But we, this is a no judgment zone when it comes to masks. If you still want to wear one, that's fine. Uh, a lot of us vaccinated, et cetera, but, uh, but we thought, well, we're meeting, we're greeting, so why can't we eat together? So we're gonna try that on July 4th, which is uh, Sunday this year. And so the sign-up sheet is back here on the table, and so please sign up if you'd like to join us for that. The front of your bulletin uh, represents uh, Juneteenth, which it has become known, June 19th, 1865. Uh, the general came into Galveston, Texas, and finally told those slaves that they were free. Uh, it had already happened uh, quite a while before by Abraham Lincoln, but it, the word didn't get to them until June 19th, 1865. So it became the official end of slavery. And so this is the official Juneteenth flag on the front of the bulletin. Uh, the one star kind of is a nod to the Lone Star State. Uh, the colors, of course, remind you of the American flag, the fact that these enslaved people were Americans as well. Uh, the burst and the ark remind you of the freedom that uh, came with that proclamation that day to them and continues on to this day. And so in our continuing racial education since last summer, we uh, want to learn about Juneteenth, which a lot of us had not really paid much attention to through the years. And so that is the explanation of the bulletin cover. I think those are the announcements I wanted to share today, and so let us stand and greet one another with the peace of Christ. <laughs> greetings, greetings. Okay, this is where I begin to try to get everybody back together. <laughs> I almost need some... Uh... Mm -hmm. 
Hey, thank you. That, uh, that actually works. All right. Uh, we will now continue with our children's time. And uh, we never know week to week. You know, we can have six or eight children. Or, as in the case today, one special person with us today. Uh-oh. Uh <laughs> well, let's... Uh, Oh, uh, James, all right. Let's give some comfort. Yeah. JJ wants to give you a little comfort. Oh. <laughs> okay, well, he's going to sit here and watch as we talk about this. But you know what I brought with me today? I brought a mustard seed. Have you ever seen a mustard seed? Let me see if I can get one out. I don't want to spill 50 of them. Oh, look, there's a mustard seed. See how small that is? So that little seed becomes a big plant. It's hard to imagine, isn't it? Something that small would become a big plant. Well, then I thought, you know, oh, Tom, I'm sorry, I've already spilled some. Uh, <laughs> it's not good. So I thought, you know, mustard seeds are kind of hard to uh, understand since we don't see them that much, but we can certainly understand an apple, huh? Is that an apple? Yeah? You want to touch it? Yeah, there you go. Yeah, so that's an apple. Well, you don't eat the whole apple, do you? Because in the middle of the apple, there's a core that we don't eat. Plus, there are these little seeds. There's little seeds there that are inside the apple. And that little seed can grow a tree. Isn't that amazing? So something that small can produce something big. The reason that's important for you to hear today is, when we look around, you're the smallest person here. But you know what? Jesus says the small becomes big, the small is very important, and the small is kind of like what his, his message is all about. He said, blessed are the children, let them come to me, for of such is my he called it a kingdom, but, but my followers are like a little child. And so you are the most important person here today. Wow. So let us thank God for you being here, and let us pray together. Thank you, God, for our children. Uh, thank you for, even though they're small, they are very, very important in your eyes. And uh, help us to appreciate that and remember it today. In Christ we pray. Amen. Thank you for being here. Well, good morning, everyone. Would you please join me in the call to worship? Listen to these words of call to worship. Let us hold fast to the confession of our hope without wavering. For he who has promised is faithful. And let us consider how to provoke one another to love and good deeds, not neglecting to meet together, as in the habit of some, but encouraging one another, and all the more as you see the day approaching. Our opening prayer. Holy and righteous God, you created us in your image. Grant us grace to contend fearlessly against evil and to make no peace with oppression. Help us like those of generations before us who resisted the evil of slavery and human bondage in any form and any manner of oppression. Help us to use our freedoms to bring justice among people and nations everywhere to the glory of your holy name, through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Now, please stand as you are able and join me in the singing of O for a World, a New Century Hymn, number 575. <laughs>
scripture this morning, hear these words from the book of Mark, chapter 4, verses 26 through 34. And I'm reading from the New International Version. Jesus also said, this is what the kingdom of God is like. A man scatters seed on the ground. Night and day, whether he sleeps or gets up, The seed sprouts and grows, though he does not know how. All by itself, the soil produces grain, first the stalk, then the head, then the full kernel forms. As soon as the grain is ripe, he puts the sickle to it, because the harvest has come. Again, Jesus said, What shall we say the kingdom of God is like? Or what parable shall we use to describe it? Hmm. It is like a mustard seed, which is the smallest of all seeds on earth. Yet when planted, it grows and becomes the largest of all garden plants, with such big branches that the birds can perch in its shade. Now with many similar parables, Jesus spoke the word to them, as much as they could understand. He did not say anything to them without using a parable. But when he was alone with his own disciples, he explained everything.
sorry, I was in a deep meditative state. I could have uh, just had that the rest of the service. That was beautiful. Thank you, Ann and Carol Sue, for sharing that with us today. I don't know about you, but that, uh, that touched me uh, spiritually. It was uh, very moving and calming and just what we needed today. So thank you very much for that. A couple of introductory things to say about today's uh, sermon. Uh, first of all, Jesus is talking about the kingdom of God and trying to tell us what the kingdom of God is like. And it occurred to me that we have different ideas and understandings of what kingdom of God means. Uh, for many, they think of it as some sort of future thing like heaven that we're waiting to see someday. Uh, but that's really not what Jesus was uh, sharing when he talked about the kingdom of God. The other thing is the language, you know, we, we don't really have kings much anymore, so kingdom we don't think about. Some people call it the reign of God, but we really don't have any reigning either. <laughs> and so some, uh, particularly feminists, want to get away from the king image, so they go to kingdom, K-I-N. You know, what would Jesus' kingdom be like, where we're all one uh, with him? But whatever word we give to this notion of kingdom, we shouldn't think of it as a place. We should think of it more as, I, I use realm because I don't know what else to say, uh, an alternate reality, perhaps, a different country. <laughs> and so sitting here today, we manifest the reign of God. We manifest the kingdom of God. Uh, Jesus said the kingdom is near you. Jesus also said the kingdom is inside you. So we have to get away from this notion that kingdom is a place, a particular place. It is more wherever God's love, justice, peace, and what God would wish for humanity was realized or manifested. And so it can take place in a church, it can take place as you go out in the community and love, share justice, whatever ways that we try to make humanity better and equal. That is a manifestation of what we call the kingdom of God or the reign of God. And so as Jesus is describing this kingdom, uh, it's not some future place to which we're going. It, it's right here and right now. As a matter of fact, Jesus came to manifest the kingdom. So wherever you see Jesus, wherever you read his words, his actions, that is a manifestation of what the kingdom of God looks like. The other thing that uh, has to be explained, I think, is this word parable, because we don't really use it anymore. And so uh, Jesus talks a lot in these parables. And so the word parable comes from para, meaning alongside, right? A paragraph is a collection of sentences, and so a paragraph comes alongside those sentences. So para, alongside, and bole, which means to throw. So one way to think about a parable is it's something that's thrown alongside to help us to understand truth. But here's the key, it, it stays over here in its parallel lane. And over here is our logic and our willingness and, and hope that we can understand everything and figure it out. Uh, parables sit over here in their own parallel lane, and they don't really often uh, become something you can totally figure out. And so that's why they have such uh, wonder about them, because you can interpret them a lot of different ways. You can look at it each year, different years, find something new. And so they never really quite come together, but you can go over to the parable side, pick up some things, bring them over to your side, and I say all of that because the first parable that Jesus tells is about a farmer who doesn't do anything. He just scatters some seed, and he goes in, and before he knows it, the harvest has come. He has no idea how it happened. And so using your logical mind, looking at this story, you'd say, oh, Jesus is telling us we don't have to do anything. You know, we can just sit back and let it all happen. No, <laughs> the parable's over here in its own lane, and, and it's shedding some truth, but don't use your logical mind all the time to try to figure it out. It, it's a snapshot, right? It's, it's not meant to speak all time to all things. But there is some truth to it. 
The, the parable is about the power of the seed. The power of the seed happens whether we do anything about it or not. I saw a cartoon about two farmers. Uh, I wish I could show it to you because it's so cute. The farmers both plant their crops. One farmer gets his lawn chair and a glass of tea, and he sits there and watches every day, not really worried about anything, and his crop, of course, comes up, right? The other farmer uh, comes out every day and looks at the field, and he's fretting and worrying and hoping, and in the end, the seed does its work, whether he was out there fretting and worrying or whether the other guy was just sitting in his lawn chair. That's the power of the seed, and that's what Jesus is saying, that the, the seed will spread and grow uh, just because of the power behind it. And, of course, here he's talking about his gospel, his word, uh, that will go forth, and it will grow, and it will spread, and nothing will stop it. Martin Luther, uh, 1500s, of course, reformer that founded the Lutheran Church, uh, he would preach on Sunday morning, right? He would spread the seed of the word, and then he would go home in the afternoon and have a beer. That, that's the joke. <laughs> <laughs> Meaning that he had done the spreading, right, of the word. There's nothing more he could do about it. It was in God's hand, and so he went home and had a good German beer. I'll be having some wine later today, just to let you know, but, but in the end, there's only so much we can do, right? And then we turn it over and trust in God. And what Jesus is saying is, his kingdom, his realm is like that. It will happen. There's nothing that's going to stop it. The power is in the seed. It cannot be stopped. The second parable is uh, about a wacky weed, the mustard plant. <laughs> I liken it to kudzu. If any of you have been in the south, around Atlanta and other places, uh, kudzu will grow. You, you can try to stop it, and you can try whatever you want. It just grows. And so you'll be going down the expressway, you look over, there's a field of kudzu on the side of the road. And so Jesus says, my kingdom, my realm, is like that wacky weed. You can try your best to stop it, but it's going to grow, and it's going to come from hardly anything. It'll be something you don't even know is there, and then all of a sudden, it will sprout. That's the power, again, of the seed, the mustard seed. And so these are the parables that he tells to describe for us what his realm is like, what his uh, way of being in a kingdom is like. The power of the seed and the power of small things becoming large. I was thinking about that smallness and how it not only starts small and grows but cannot be stopped uh, in thinking about this church. Uh, 1880, founded. Uh, you can look at our list of pastors over here that from the very beginning. And I'm sure there were some lean times. I'm sure where, if you were the farmer, you'd come out and look at this field and say, boy, they're not going to make it. <laughs> That's not going to survive. And yet it kept going. And so we sit here this many years later from, 19, or from 1880 uh, in this building from 1905, and it just kept going. That's the mystery of God's kingdom, God's reign. I have here the parish caller from September of 1945. There's a bunch of them together here, and they used to bind them. Isn't that cute? Uh, our parish caller is our church newsletter. And so I found this in our uh, library collection. And it's the newsletter of the church from uh, September of 1945. And I looked and I thought, well, we are debt-free. Mr. Parker, who was our pastor for a lot of years, uh, brought to the congregation the reality that we now had sufficient funds to retire 
all of the outstanding indebtedness on the property. And then the very next thing they talk about is the improvement fund that they started. And they now had more than $100 so designated. And in addition, 225 also to set aside for that fund. And so here back in 1945, after all the quiet work of the generation before, this church became debt free. And from 1945 to now has enjoyed that status. Just a small seed planted here in Prescott and you couldn't stop it. The seed grew, the seed expanded, and the seed is still here. The power of God, really, the power exhibited in the kingdom of God, in the realm of God, and continues to this day. You know, we are just a small uh, <laughs> gathering. I think we had our heyday probably back in the 50s and had a lot more people than we do now, but, uh, you know, we've always been relatively small compared to a lot of the other churches in town, but just because you're small doesn't mean uh, you're not important, that you don't do meaningful things. We just had the fifth anniversary of the Pulse nightclub shooting in Orlando. I think to this day, still the, the second highest number of people that have died in a mass shooting. I think 50 some died, 40 some were injured. And so five years ago, our little church decided to have a gathering to show solidarity with those people. This is before recent years where we've had all kinds of other shootings and mass shootings happening. But back then it was kind of on the front of all of these things that have happened since. And so everybody was kind of shocked by this. And so we needed a place for all of us to gather to not only show support, but to pray and to show our solidarity. And so five years ago, right out, where is the Larkin? Back there. <laughs> Yeah? <laughs> oh, over there? I don't know. Wherever Larkin Street is out here, um, we have a door that goes out of the kitchen back here, and there's a little balcony there. When you go out today, you'll perhaps see it. I think we have our sign, 140th anniversary sign on it now. But if you can imagine, we had speakers up on that platform, more than 100 people gathered out. The, the street was shut down for us. We had more than 100 people out there gathered in solidarity, and we had speakers, and, and we did that. That was our little, <laughs> little church that made that happen. Uh, and so the power of something small growing and expanding. Well, let's take it to a personal level now. These parables, these stories, these ways to describe God's realm, God's kingdom. Uh, what does it say to us individually? I don't know about you, but uh, I think sometimes we don't give ourselves enough credit for the small things that we do. You know, we do things and we don't really have a larger perspective on how we have contributed to something important. Think about all the lessons you taught your children, the lessons you teach your grandchildren, uh, the volunteer ways that you help in the community, being here this morning. All these ways are, are they're small things, but they grow and they contribute to something much larger happening. And that's the case, I think, for being a citizen of this country, we all contribute in ways to make this a better place in which we live. We all can contribute to a church, an organization, in ways that we think are small, but together, collectively, they grow. And they're much more important collectively than what we think we're doing individually. And so I think that's part of the lesson of these parables, is that though something might be small, uh, though something might look like it's not going to happen, the time it does, and we have contributed. 
Today we're remembering Juneteenth, which is June 19th coming up. And I was thinking about the slaves as they were there in Texas, Galveston area particularly, as the general rode in. Uh, they didn't know it, but they had already been set free. And as the general came in and they heard it for the first time, what a powerful experience that must have been. But it really kind of reminds you of the kingdom of God as well because sometimes it's hidden. Uh, sometimes it's not manifesting itself like we wish it would, and that's what makes it a mystery so much, is that it can be happening and we don't really know it yet. And with time, we will discover it. As we come to Pride Sunday in a couple weeks, same thing happened with the LGBTQ rights and marriage equality and all of that. It just sort of snuck up on us, you know. We, <laughs> we were uh, going along and all of a sudden, wow, what a change has happened in 10 or 20 years from where we used to be. Uh, and we hope the same thing for racism, that uh, we make these incremental steps. And sometimes we wonder in the mystery of it all what's really happening, but quietly, it's growing. Quietly, the seed and the power of the seed is making change possible. Same thing for our individual lives. Sometimes we wonder where God is. We wonder what we're supposed to do. You know, are we really making any difference? And it's good to be reminded that small can be good, and sometimes you just have to give patient time to things to see them develop. May God help us all to do that today. Amen. We're going to have a litany now, which is an adaption, adaptation of Lift Every Voice and Sing, which is in our hymnal. And it was a poem written by James Weldon Johnson and set to music by his brother for Lincoln's birthday in 1905. And has since that day become sort of a, a black national anthem. Uh, that uh, has been set to this litany. And so uh, Linda will be joining me. I invite you to read along as I read these words today. And as Linda reads these words. Celebration rises up from the deep places, finding voice in the light and air no longer deny. Lift every voice and sing. Sing till heaven and earth ring. Ring with the harmonies of liberty. Celebration rises, not blind to the suffering, not blind to the sorrow. Celebration comes at a cost. Stony the road we trod, bitter the chastening rod, felt in the days when hope unborn had died. Yet with a steady beat, have not our weary feet come to the place for which our parents sighed. Celebration rises, remembering the way we have come, the paths taken that have brought us here now to this place and time of celebration. Celebration rises up and up, full of remembering. Remembering lives and freedom stolen, we have come over a way that with tears has been watered, we have come treading our path through the blood of the slaughtered, out from the gloomy past, till now we stand at last where the white gleam of our bright star is cast. Celebration rises, recognizing what has been done and left undone, knowing there is still and yet much to do so much further to go. Celebration rises, naming the victories, recognizing the challenges yet ahead. Celebration rises on voices offering unfinished praise, lest our feet stray from the places, our God, where we meet thee, lest our hearts drink with the wine of the world, we forget thee. Celebration rises, resisting illusions, to be embraced by the real and abiding presence of God who breaks our chains and sets us free for freedom. 
in power and love and joy. God of our weary years, God of our silent tears, thou who has brought us thus far on our way, thou who has by thy might led us into the light, keep us forever in the path, we pray. Celebration rises with the power of healing wings and promise to endure. Celebration rises, celebrating that by God's grace, I am because you are. You are because I am. Celebrating that the fullness of my humanity does not diminish yours, and the fullness of your humanity does not diminish mine. Shadowed beneath thy hand, may we forever stand, true to our God, true to our native land, true to who we are, true to who we have been, and who we are becoming, thanks be to God. Always remember, you have within you the strength, the patience, and the passion to reach for the stars to change the world. Now I've been free. I know what a dreadful condition slavery is. I have seen hundreds of escaped slaves, but I never saw one who was willing to go back and be a slave. And now this quote from Frederick Douglass. Liberty is meaningless where the right to utter one's thoughts and opinions has ceased to exist. That of all rights is the dread of tyrants. It is the right which they first of all strike down. They know its power. Thrones, dominions, principalities, and powers founded in injustice and wrong are sure to tremble if men are allowed to reason. Equally clear is the right to hear. To suppress free speech is a double wrong. It violates the rights of the hearer as well as those of the speaker. Let us join together in prayer. Oh God, we thank you for our freedom. We're about to celebrate it July 4th. We thank you for the freedom we have in Christ, freedom to be those who you have created us to be. We are grateful today for the freedom that arose back in that day in Galveston, Texas, and with the Emancipation Proclamation. And we pray that going forward, freedom might more and more be realized in our nation. We lift up to you the personal requests that we all bring with us today. As a church family, we pray for uh, Sue, we pray for Wendy, we pray for others who are on our hearts today that need you as the great physician to bring healing for them. And we pray that in the mystery of your kingdom, the mystery of your ways, you would give us insight, eyes to see, patience, and the ability to know that you are with us whether we can sense it or not, and to know that what we are doing is making a difference, whether we can experience it and feel it or not. Help us to be faithful and help us to have hope, hope that one day your kingdom, your reign, would be fully realized on this earth as love and peace and justice are shared. We pray this through Christ our Lord, who taught us to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Come now to our morning offering. And uh, for the sake of our online audience, uh, thank all of you, whether here in person or remote, for continuing to support us. Uh, you may send a check in the mail, you may 
hit our online giving button on our website, or uh, you can use online bill pay through your bank. Why not let them pay for the stamp? And uh, in all these ways you continue to support us, and we are grateful for that. And uh, again, we're still receiving our offering mysteriously. Uh, <laughs> you know, there's a lot of things the pandemic makes you kind of think about and question, and taking up with the offering was one of them. We're like, should we do that again, or should we just keep the plates back here and let people put it in as they wish? And so that's kind of still in limbo, but uh, just one of the many things you think about uh, coming out of our year of shutdown. And so let us join together in prayer. Thank you, God, for your faithfulness and for the faithfulness of the people of this congregation, both now and in the past, who have brought us to this moment where uh, we can be still your church in this place, uh, small but mighty, because of your power and the power of your word. Uh, grant your blessings upon all who give today, we pray, through Christ our Lord. Amen. We come now to our final hymn, which is We Shall Overcome, number 570. Let us stand together. <laughs> Once again, our thanks to uh, Anne for being here with the harp. It's not every day we get to hear a harp, so thank you very much. And Linda and Carol Sue, as always, thank you for being here. And thank you all for joining us. We do have communion available down front after the service, as you wish. 
and we'll gather in Perkins Hall, as you wish, for a time of fellowship. But may we go now with this benediction. We may think ourselves small and insignificant, but because of God's power and because of God's realm, we are being used in ways we probably don't even know and don't fully appreciate. So go forth to manifest the kingdom of God in the world. Amen.